So uh, one of the things that uh, is really important to us is to have a forum like this free of charge, and it's a catered forum free of charge. And the only way that we can do that is by partnering with uh, some of our sponsors. And uh, we've been very lucky to have a, a good relationship with the VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation, and they uh, partner with a corporate sponsor every year that uh, generously support the forum. So this year, we're very grateful uh, to have um, RBC, uh, let's see if I can get back here, uh, RBC uh, sponsor uh, our event. And uh, I also want to mention that some of the things that you uh, will see today um, would not be possible uh, without your support. And some of you in the room have contributed uh, significantly to our research. And as you will see, some of the very high-risk projects that we work on, those are the things that eventually uh, will lead to new drugs and new discoveries. And it's very difficult to fund those things. So if you want to partner with us, we certainly uh, welcome that, and we're grateful for those of you who have done this already. So today we have divided the, uh, day, uh, the morning uh, in two halves. The first part, you'll see some lectures on novel therapeutics of new drugs, and I'll give you a little update on where the field is now and what the most exciting uh, news of the last year have been. And the second half, we'll, we have some more practical advice on driving, uh, some practical advice, and, and our colleagues from the Alzheimer's Society of BC on uh, dementia-friendly communities, uh, as well as how information about Alzheimer's disease is portrayed in the media and how you may access that and how that uh, affects uh, the knowledge that you get from it. So just to get started, we want this forum to be an ongoing conversation with you. And for those of you who were here last year, you might remember that this is the exact same slide I used last year. Hopefully there'll be some new slides, but this is the exact same one, because we're still working on this. And I want to continue where we left off last year to tell you what happened since uh, I showed you these slides. And this remains a very important aspect of Alzheimer's disease. So what you're looking at are slides or pictures from the brain of someone who had Alzheimer's disease. And there are two main things you will see when you look at someone's brain like this. One is an amyloid plaque, which you may have read about in the media, you may have read about elsewhere. That's the one that's depicted here uh, on, the, on the left. This is an amyloid plaque. And the other one is a neurofibrillary tangle, uh, also more popular known as tau. You'll hear about both today, but these are the, the principal uh, pathologies or buildup of gunk, if you want, in the brain if you have Alzheimer's disease. And there are, is a lot of effort trying to target these um, as a therapeutic for this disease. And just to give you a sense, I don't think this picture really does justice. You just see one single plaque. This is just to show you how extensive the plaque is, is in the brain. It's, it, it's all over the brain. Millions and millions of deposits over uh, a lifetime will eventually lead to this. And as we touched on last time, one of the real breakthroughs in diagnostics has been our ability to detect amyloid uh, in life. So it used to be that you had to have an autopsy. That's where these pictures up here are coming from. But now you can look in someone's brain, in a living brain, living person, and do the same thing. And that's what's depicted here. This is a PET scan. We're not quite here in terms of uh, being able to offer this in British Columbia yet, uh, but we're getting there. But what you'll hear today uh, from one of our colleagues, is that you don't necessarily need a PET scan. You may just need uh, another test from a lumbar puncture to get the same type of information uh, in a much cheaper way. And that's one of the, the developments that we've done here uh, locally. And this is just, again, to show the PET. Uh, you don't need to have uh, a lot of training to recognize that this looks different than that. <laughs> that's what we do. Um, uh, so here's someone with Alzheimer's disease, and here's someone who does not. And you can see that uh, when it lights up, that means that that person has a lot of amyloid plaque in the brain. And uh, again, this is something we, we talked about last year, but it's important to stress the importance of being able to look in someone, someone's brain early on is that you can actually track when Alzheimer's really starts. And this is not completely settled, but what we do know is that uh, if you're... I just made some, uh, some ages up here, but let's say that you're 70 and you're seen in our clinic with some, some mild symptoms, uh, and that person may eventually move on to get Alzheimer's disease. It turns out that it didn't start 
here, it started 30 years before. So in many ways, Alzheimer's starts in your 40s, believe it or not, and you don't get symptoms until many decades later. So this has really opened up an area of focus where we try to develop therapeutics and target early treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And that's where PET imaging, and as you'll hear today, uh, biomarker testing really becomes important because we want to identify those uh, who are at risk. So uh, I posed this question last time, and I want to pose it again because we think this is of interest. Um, let's say that we had a test that uh, you could have um, for Alzheimer's disease, but we're not quite up to speed in terms of therapeutics. We're not quite as far along as we are with diagnostics. So if you could get a test that would indicate that you are at risk for having Alzheimer's disease without a therapy, would you want to have that test? And um, let's see if this uh, works here. So here's our little poll again. So A for yes and B for no. So, uh, oops, I, I got that wrong here, didn't I? Okay, let's do that again. Um, all right, so it's A for no and B for yes. So if you want the test, you click B. If you don't want the test, you press A. Okay. So that's, um, that's very similar to last year. So I think we got around uh, 80% or so that, that would really want to have the test. And this is something that's important for us uh, as, we, as we continue to develop these th therapeutics. So let me tell you a little bit about other diagnostic markers. And we talked about this uh, last year as well. So uh, you may have amyloid in the brain. We can detect that now with a PET scan or, as you learn, other biomarkers. Uh, we also have another type of PET that looks at uh, sugar uptake in the brain. And as you can see here, do you see how uh, pale it looks there? It looks very pale here. And it, it should look like this, nice and uniform and black. And that simply means that the brain is unable to take up glucose in that area. And it means that it's not functioning properly. And here's a, a, another representation of that. All the blue stuff means areas of the brain that is not taking up glucose properly. So this is another way we can diagnose Alzheimer's disease by the pattern of glucose uptake in the brain. And there are a lot of efforts trying to uh, develop therapeutics to target that uh, energy uptake. So what I've just said is uh, we have some things we know is happening in the brain, and there are many efforts to try to target that. And that's where clinical trials come into play, and that's what I want to uh, show you what the, the progress has been in the last year. So uh, you can target amyloid either by removing it or preventing its accumulation, uh, or you can neutralize its effect. And, of course, another uh, therapeutic avenue is also to target tau, and you'll learn more about that in a, in a lecture later on today. And the other strategy would be, instead of giving the, the brain sugar, you could give it an alternative fuel to sort of bypass this problem taking up glucose. But what beta amyloid, or what A beta, are you going to target? This becomes a, a very important issue in the next lecture. So what we've talked about so far is this plaque, also depicted here where you see the distribution of the plaque. And uh, this is represented by this, this uh, uh, drawing here. But it turns out that that's the end stage of uh, the life, if you will, of beta amyloid. It has many stages. And it goes from being uh, a single molecule of A beta, then it turns into this soluble uh, assembly. We call it an oligomer. But it's on its way in many ways, to becoming a plaque. But it turns out that this may not be the biggest problem. This is a big problem. And there's a lot of uh, efforts now to develop therapeutics. And you heard from one of the, the world experts in this, Dr. Cashman, who will discuss with you uh, his efforts to try to, uh, to target this and how, uh, in terms of spread, uh, the soluble A-beta works. OK, so a little update. Some of you may have read recently in the news media that Eli Lilly had a big trial. Uh, and you have to pardon these, the names of these drugs are, are terrible for, for remembering. So uh, you don't have to remember this. But this is called solanuzumab. It's been in many trials now. The latest one had thousands of patients in this stage where you had very mild Alzheimer's disease. That was your diagnosis. And you were treated with this drug which targets amyloid. 
And unfortunately, um, although we sort of expected this, but unfortunately it does not look like this drug uh, will work. And for that reason, they have also uh, canceled some of their future programs, although they have some ongoing still. Another nice name for you to uh, maybe uh, try to remember. Um, this is uh, another drug, and this has been all over the news. And if you noticed on the front page of the, uh, of the brochure this year, uh, you saw a couple of pictures, and that's what this aducanumab uh, drug is, uh, uh, is about. So they looked at the same region, and this is perhaps, I would say, one of the most exciting developments potentially in Alzheimer's that we've seen in the last decade. So here again, you have a, a PET image of uh, an Alzheimer brain. It has amyloid in it, which is why it has all the colors. And look what happens when you treat uh, with this aducanumab drug one year later. It's gone. And this is the highest dose, but over a year, uh, and now they've extended it uh, to 18 months, uh, this drug will normalize, virtually normalize, uh, plaque levels in the brain. So for the first time in the history of Alzheimer's disease, we now have a drug that can reduce, effectively reduce this amyloid in the brain to almost normal levels. But what does that mean? And this is where I think it's important to make the distinction between removing amyloid and a therapy. Because while we think removing amyloid is a therapy, we don't know yet. So the next study, and they are recruiting now uh, 2,700 subjects in two trials. Uh, they're called Engage and Emerge. We are one of the sites for those trials uh, to answer that question. So now they're able to remove amyloid. Um, does that impact cognitive function? And they did some preliminary testing, but really this is the test, and we don't know that yet. But there's a considerable excitement in the field about this. However, 50%, so half of people who got the drug had some complication that uh, may lead to stopping the drug. So it's not without risk. Those side effects tend to uh, resolve spontaneously, but keep that in mind. This is one approach. Uh, it's promising, uh, but it, it, it's not without complications. But we'll find out in a few years. So 2020, they estimate the trial will be completed, and then some results will start, start trickling in, and we'll keep you posted on what happens. I also mentioned last time there are two uh, trials that are ongoing in this space. So you might think, well, why, why aren't we treating in this space if you can detect it and you think someone will get Alzheimer's later on uh, and we can, we can really prevent it early, uh, why not do that? And there are two trials that are trying to do that. They're called A4 and Diane. They're ongoing, but they're treating people who are asymptomatic, so no symptoms but they have a biomarker, we call it biomarker evidence, so even they have a PET scan that's amyloid positive, which suggests that they are at risk for getting Alzheimer's disease, or they have some other evidence of the same. So these will read out over the next several years, and again, it's, it's exciting, it's important, uh, and we'll keep you posted, but we don't have anything to report on that front today. You will learn a little bit today about exercise, and that's really looking in this very early region to see whether lifestyle interventions uh, can impact the, the disease course. And finally, a few slides. Um, I, know, I mentioned last time the other way to um, attack Alzheimer's disease is not to remove amyloid, but it's to prevent its toxicity. And uh, I always say when I show this slide, this is really one of my favorite slides in neuroscience. So what you're looking at here is a, a little piece of a nerve cell a single nerve cells. You have billions of, billions of these in your brain. They make connections. And the way they make connections is uh, through these, we call them dendritic spines. They're little tiny protrusions, and they connect together uh, to really make the complexity of the brain and make, make you who you are. And in Alzheimer's disease, and this is depicted here, if you add this amyloid onto this, uh, it's toxic. So uh, you lose these dendritic spines over time. So this is just showing you that arrow there is the same as this one. It's the same, same segment, and it's gone after you, re after you add this amyloid. So it's a, just a, a model of toxicity. And we have this drug that was developed for, for cancer called seracatinib uh, that we repurposed for use in Alzheimer's because some of the signaling pathways are the same. 
And I mentioned this last year, the new uh, report this year is that we now completed the enrollment of 159 patients uh, across North America, seven here at UBC, and um, it will report in a year. So I really hope next year, if you come here, we'll be able to show you some results from this different approach to amyloid, if you will. And then finally, um, how do you attack this sugar problem? And a lot of you uh, may be familiar with coconut oil, but it turns out coconut oil, although there's something to it, it's not strong enough. So 10% of coconut oil contains the active ingredient, which is called MCT, or medium-chain triglycerides. Um, and we are taking that component and really concentrating it into a drink. Now, you may think, looking at this, you, you get to go to the beach as well, but you don't. Um, but we're enrolling uh, patients now in this study where you take a, a concentrated, basically, coconut oil drink to see if that can modify this energy problem. And we've recruited five so far. We're looking to recruit 40, and we hope to report some results, not next year, but the year after that. And then I want to leave you with this. So... Um, The innovation or high-risk um, projects, they're difficult to fund, but they ultimately lead to not only innovation, but new discoveries. And I want to make a pitch, and I want to, again, thank you for those of you who have contributed, but some of this work is not possible without contributions outside of typical government funding. Uh, typically through private uh, um, contributions. So what you're looking at here is exactly what I showed you in that picture of, of these nerve cells. These are a bunch of nerve cells, and nerve cells do what they like to do, so they make connections to each other, and this happens to be a live culture. So you see these pulses of activity, so that's spontaneous signaling between one nerve cells to the other, just as I'm talking to you now, and hopefully as you're listening, you're making all these connections. This is what's happening in your brain. Now, what's unique about this, this was actually made from a blood cell. So we take, we take blood cells and we reprogram them into a nerve cell. And then we can grow them in a dish. We can make little uh, mini brains in a dish and study early development. So this is a picture of that. These are from a patient, believe it or not, with Alzheimer's disease who has a genetic predisposition. So we reprogram the blood cells and we make nerve cells out of them. And that's important because we think that the communication between neurons is altered in Alzheimer's disease, and this allows us to study that to see if we can make drugs that intervene. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you for your attention. I think this is going to be a really fantastic day, uh, and hopefully you'll uh, go home with new inspiration and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nygaard. Dr. Nygaard is the director for the Clinic for Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders, and he's very strict about time in these meetings. And uh, we're going to have to uh, jig something on his behalf, but since he's the boss, we'll let him do that. <laughs>